Hope you're all doing well. Just checking all the technology is working. Yeah. Hello. Hope you're all coping well. How about, um, as we wait for people to join, how about sharing some of your favourite jokes from the Bible? Well, I grew up in the Mance, and so, yeah, one of our, my favourite hobbies was, uh, when I was younger, lots of jokes from the Bible. Here's, go and share them on Facebook if you want. Uh, here's a couple of my favourites. So one question was, who is the shortest man in the Bible? And the answer is found in the book of Job. That's Bildad the shoe height. Boom, boom. Uh, and then this is one of my dad's favourites. Uh, this is jokes from the Bible. Hi, Howard. Uh, one of my dad's favourite was who was the biggest woman in the Bible? And the answer is the woman of Samaria. Again, boom, boom. And that's not just a really corny joke. That's also a heads up because our Bible passage for today is in John 4. And I'll be reading about Jesus talking to the woman of Samaria a bit later. But anyway, why don't you uh, you share in your favourite jokes? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but I hope you're all doing really well. I'm sure Howard's got some he could share. Also, while we're we're waiting for people to join, uh, while we're waiting for people to join, it is some updates from various people. I've been on the telephone this morning talking to church members who are not able to join online. So here's a few updates. I was chatting to David and Kay Frost, and they're both doing pretty well. So they send their love to everyone. And here's a good idea. This David and Kay are obviously not on the internet. Their eldest daughter has come up with a good plan. What she does is she calls them at 3 p.m. every afternoon on the telephone. And she's got um, some exercises that so she with her husband and I think uh, one of their children, they do some very, very gentle exercises, gentle aerobics, uh, and they explain over the phone to David and Kay what to do and they join in. And once they spend a few a bit, few minutes doing those gentle exercises, then um, they do a quiz together. That's right. So using the telephone to stay connected. Uh, that's an update from David and Kay Frost. Uh, they send their love. David's obviously very tired, uh, sleeps a lot, uh, but both of them doing pretty well. Uh, and then, hi, Peter. And then um, I've just spoken to Ken Watts on the phone. Ken is his usual self. He was holding forth on the phone, uh, explaining what's happening with the COVID-19. He thinks uh, this is a wake-up lesson, lesson for Western civilization, and he was comparing it to the fall of the Roman Empire, where we think we're too wealthy and we're in charge but actually it's God. So that was Ken. Uh, some good news, well, good and bad news. Uh, Ken has been having some problems with his arms and I've been bothering him for ages to go to the doctor and he finally has. And the doctor thinks it could be the onset of arthritis. So that's not great news for Ken, but uh, he was worried it was something more serious. So, so overall, um, he, you know, Ken's doing really well. Ken sends his love. Anyway, so that's a, a quick update uh, from David and Kay Frost and from Ken Watts. Uh, Howard says, the joke is that my moustache has gone. Uh, thank you. I love you too. Morning, Diane. Good to see you as well. Hope you're all doing well. I was uh, saying, sharing some really corny jokes from the Bible. If you've got any others you can share to make us laugh in the middle of lockdown, please pass them on. But I hope hope you're all doing really well. Hi, Frank and Bernice as well. Welcome to you. Don't forget, not just jokes, share prayer requests as well. If there's any updates you want to pass on, uh, want us to pray for anything, uh, please uh, share that. Oh, Karen says hello. Don't forget to pray for Karen. We're getting used to ministry under lockdown and doing things in different ways. And this is half term for school so normally there would be lighthouse today so lots of children come to the church karen and others do activity with them well good for karen lighthouse is going ahead it's just not happening at church it's happening on zoom online at the moment during the day uh, so pray for karen and others helping out with that as they have a a busy day today hi anita 
Hi, Barbara. Hope you're doing well. As I say, don't forget to, to pray for Lighthouse. Hope Karen and the team are doing really well. Hi, Zenobia. As I say, hope you're all doing really, really well. Right, well, uh, according to my watch, it's now 12 o'clock. Uh, so I'd uh, share a devotion, something thinking about recently. I don't know if uh, all of you caught the news story it's from a couple of days ago that made me think is it's particularly relevant to us as we live in a very multicultural part of Harrow, Northwest London. I don't know if you saw on the news that a church in Berlin recently has opened its doors to allow Muslims to pray in the church. Uh, as I'm sure you know, Eid is being celebrated by Muslims at the end of Ramadan and um, uh, the, it was the Dar es Salaam Mosque in Berlin. C clearly, normally they would have hundreds, probably thousands of worshippers coming to, to pray at the, to celebrate Eid. And because of social distancing, they couldn't fit in the mosque. So a church in Berlin opened its doors so that Muslims could come and pray in their church. I don't know what you think about it. There was lots of, uh, lots of discussion uh, and lots of people saying all sorts of things. Uh, about whether that was a good or a bad thing. And I've been, just been thinking about uh, that exact scenario is unlikely. It was an exception. It wasn't, they weren't, the church was not saying that uh, Muslims could come all the time, but particularly because of lockdown, because of celebrating Eid, they offered. And what do we think about that? Well, what I thought I'd do is uh, read from that passage. I mentioned the woman of Samaria earlier. earlier. I'm going to read from John chapter 4 something Jesus said to that woman and help us think through some of the issues. If ever we were in a similar situation, what would we think about that? So this is John chapter four, verses 21 to 24. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the father, neither on this mountain, that's Mount Gerizim, presumably, nor in Jerusalem, Mount Zion. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. There we go. That's John chapter four. Hi to Karen. She says they've had a really good session um, at uh, Lighthouse. Hi to Peter and Celia. Hi to Janice. Anyway, so that's that passage from John 4. And I just want to briefly to notice three things Jesus says as he speaks into a sort of a, a pluralistic, multi-religious context. Three things from that passage. One thing that Jesus accepts and two things that Jesus rejects. First of all, from verse 22, notice he, that Jesus accepts the freedom of religion. Jesus does not say, shouldn't be allowed, stop the temple in Mount, on Mount Gerizim. He doesn't say Samaritans should be stopped from worshipping because it's just the Jews. Actually, verse 22, as he interacts with this uh, Samaritan woman, implies the freedom of religion. Though he didn't, although he didn't agree, agree with how the Samaritans worshipped, he wasn't expecting them to be shut down right away. So that's interesting. Number one, Jesus accepts, so he seems to hear, the freedom of religion, that people should be allowed, even if they're wrong, to worship God as they seek. And that's particularly relevant to Baptists. I don't know if you're aware, but uh, one of Baptists sort of founding principles was about the freedom of religion. They're very involved in the toleration acts of the 17th century. And so, for example, Thomas Hulis, he was uh, one of the first Baptists. He wrote a paper in 1612. It was probably, he was uh, as an exile in Amsterdam, so it was probably printed in, ex in Amsterdam. And he wrote this, he, he would talk about Turks. By Turks, he means Muslims. And he wrote about freedom of conscience. So uh, this, is, this is a quotation from Thomas Hulis. So this is 1612. Our Lord the King is but an earthly king, and he hath no authority as a king, but in earthly causes. And if the king's people be obedient and true subjects, obeying all humane laws made by the king, our lord the king can require no more. 
for men's religion to God is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it. Neither may the king be judged between God and man. Let them be heretics, Turks, as I said, he means Muslims by that, Jews, or whatsoever it appertains, not to the earthly power to punish them in the least measure. Now, in, in Thomas Hill's day, there would have, he might have met some uh, Muslims and Jews in, in Holland, in Amsterdam. There wouldn't have been many in Britain, maybe a few uh, uh, diplomats from Mor Morocco or Persia. Uh, maybe some sailors have become Muslims as they were captured in the Mediterranean. So there wouldn't have been a lot, there have been, there'd been some, but he was arguing for the freedom of religion, that people should be able to worship uh, in their own way and that the law should allow for that. One thing uh, it's just worth noticing passing, though, is that uh, Thomas Hughes himself as a Baptist also was a minority. So he he didn't have the rights of freedom of religion. And that is interesting. If you look over history, uh, it tends to be those who are minorities themselves that argue for the freedom of religion. When, sadly, when Christians get in charge, when they're the state church, when they're the ones with power, then often freedom of religion, they get a bit quiet on that. But anyway, that's the first thing from John 4. Number one, Jesus seems to accept the freedom of religion. So that's one thing he accepts. But, but two things he rejects. Uh, two things he rejects. We notice he rejects religious pluralism and relativism. He does not say all religions are the same and they're just, uh, you know, they're just worshipping God in their own way. He says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. So Jesus is very clear about that. He, he rejects pluralism. He rejects the fact that all religions are basically just sort of roots up the same mountain. He says exclusively uh, salvation is just from the Jews. But another thing, notice that he rejects, this is in verse 21 and verse 24, he rejects the idea of sacred space. He does, he, in other words, he does not say that, you know, you have to worship God in a particular building, that it matters where you are. That's the contrast. The Samaritans had a temple on Mount Gerizim, which he refers to. Obviously, Jews went to the Jerusalem, to the temple to worship. And he actually says, no, it, God is spirit. There will come a time where you don't have to worship in a particular place, uh, but God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. So three things to guide our thinking. Freedom of religion that Jesus accepts, uh, but he rejects religious pluralism and he rejects sacred space. So how, if, if a situation like that occurred in, in Harrow, how would that help us think this through well first of all i think as christians we'd want to say it's important under british law to allow muslims to worship in their own way that we don't want to prohibit them from doing that uh, they we should allow and if if it's restricted in some ways we should be protesting or whatever you want to do encouraging the government to allow them to do that and i say that especially as a society becomes more secular uh, when, as it were, in the future, we may well be in the same boat as Muslims. So we should remember that and we should be all in favour of, of religious tolerance in that sense. However, at the same time, uh, sorry, next thing, uh, we reject sacred space. So I don't think the fact that Muslims are in buildings owned by a church necessarily makes any difference. Uh, we've had uh, people come into RLBC, Buddhists, there's a lady who was a Buddhist a few years ago who would come in and said, is it okay if I pray? And I said, yeah, sure, if you just want to sit at the back and just quietly pray, uh, I, that doesn't mind, I don't mind, I'm not going to sort of censor your prayers in any way. So the space isn't public. However, the last point, the point that uh, Jesus rejects religious pluralism is a bit more complicated, isn't it? Personally, I don't think it was a good idea that this church allowed uh, Muslims in to, to celebrate, not because I wanted to stop them praying, uh, but because of what they pray. Uh, when Muslims practice Salat, uh, they pray a prayer that is very clear. They pray to Allah and they pray that there is no God but Allah. Their prayers are very, very clearly saying basically Christianity is wrong. So in our supporting Muslims to worship and giving them freedom to do that, I think we've got to be careful that we're not maybe unintentionally, but implying that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that the way they pray is saying Christianity is wrong. 
we don't want to act in a way that implies we don't mind that. So I'm not, not going to give you a clear answer here, but I'm saying there are lots of complicated issues that we'd want to work through. The idea of sacred space. Are we getting hung up about the actual building being more important than it should? But also the fact that there is only one way to worship God, that's through Jesus. And then also throwing into the mix the whole idea of religious tolerance. So you, can you see it's complicated? Uh, but I want to throw that open now. I think we need to pray and think through this carefully because who knows, it's the kind of factor that we could have to face in the church as a church in the future. And so let's think and pray about that and apply passages like uh, John 4 to the situations in the future. Because what we see from Jesus, those three things. So the one thing that Jesus accepts, Jesus accepts freedom of religion. But the two things he rejects are he rejects religious pluralism. He rejects the sense that, well, it doesn't really matter how you pray to God. No, he says there's only one way to pray to God. It's through Jesus. And he also rejects the idea of sacred space, that somehow it matters where you pray. No, Jesus says we can pray and speak to God anywhere. So why don't we uh, uh, think about that as we turn to prayer in a moment? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read through all your comments and then I'm going to pray for that and then we're done. So Karen says, we had a great first session this morning at Lighthouse. Children are now learning Psalm 145 verse 3 and doing some creations at home to demonstrate that God is everywhere. Oh, very relevant to our passage. Very relevant. The space doesn't matter particularly. And then we're meeting for session two at one o'clock. So we'll pray for that. Howard says, uh, please pray for two elderly neighbours. That's Jenny and Taiko, I think you pronounce it both with terminal cancer, so we'll pray for them. Hope to catch sight of them tonight in clap for carers. Yeah, and Zenobia says about um, religious tolerance, that's good as well. And uh, Shamila says hello. So any other prayer requests, please send them in. Uh, I'm gonna pray now. Just check on this one as well. Hi, Ian. Hi, Rianne. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Colin. So uh, let's let's uh, turn all of this to prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, first of all, we want to respond to what Jesus said in John 4 and acknowledge that in Britain today, we live in a multicultural society where we rub shoulders every day with people who have no faith at all. They're atheists or humanists, and they might have different faiths. They might be particularly in this area, there might be Hindus or Buddhists or Muslims. And we pray that we might live in a way that acknowledges that uh, freedom of religion is a personal decision and we're not gonna impose our religion on anyone, uh, but we want all men and women and children freely to turn to Christ and trust in him. So we pray as a church that we might uh, recognize that and as believers, we might encourage and support the freedom of religion locally and acknowledge that it uh, doesn't matter uh, what religion people belong to. They're all equally citizens of the United Kingdom and have the same rights and responsibilities of us all. However, Father, we also acknowledge that there is something unique about Jesus and that Jesus calls us to pray to you through him alone. And we acknowledge that. As he says, he is the only way uh, to God. He is the way, the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And so we pray that as we act as a church, uh, we might be gracious and welcoming towards those of other faith, but never in a way that undermines that uh, uniqueness of the Christian gospel, never implying that it doesn't matter that you can come through any route. Uh, but may we be very clear that Jesus is the only way to know you and that that's a gift. Uh, that's not something that we can earn. That doesn't make us any better. That doesn't mean that Christians are better than any other religions or those of none, uh, but it is simply a work of your grace. And we pray that you might help us to act like that in dealing with these complex issues. That simultaneously as a church, we might be welcoming to outsiders and not judgmental and not pushing people out. Uh, but at the same time, holding firmly to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need such wisdom to do that in a way uh, that is both uh, loving, but also truthful. So for your gracious wisdom, we pray. 
at these times, particularly under the coronavirus. Help us to be wise in how we act to outsiders. Father, we want to pray uh, specifically for the lighthouse going on, for the children. We thank you as they learn Psalm 145 verse 3. And we pray for them as they make their creations, help these young lives understand that you are everywhere. And because of that, that means through Jesus, we can pray to you anywhere, anytime, any place, anywhere. Help the children by your spirit to understand that. And we want to pray, as Howard does, we want to pray for uh, his neighbours, for Jenny and Teiko, uh, struggling with cancer. Uh, we pray for opportunities of the uh, the life-giving resurrection hope of Jesus Christ to be shared with them. Help them as they um, grow in all uh, grow <laughs> grow in all your goodness to us. Uh, Heavenly Father, we want to pray for uh, people like David and Kay Frost and others in our fellowship who, uh, because of lockdown, are not able to meet uh, with anyone. Uh, pray. We thank you for the wonders of uh, telephones, etc. And we pray for other ways that we can engage with them. We can Watts and others too. We thank you for these members of our family and we pray that you'll bless them. And we lift up to you other issues now. I'm just going to have a moment's silence, uh, give you an opportunity to pray for specific situations known only to you. So a moment's silence. Heavenly Father, you hear the desires of our hearts. You hear all our prayers, those spoken as well as those unspoken. So we, we pray that you will hear these requests in and through the name of Jesus Christ, whom you taught us to pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So good to hear you. I was smiling part way through the prayer because I noticed John Lovell has pointed out that rubbing shoulders might not be such a good idea at present. Thanks, John. I meant that metaphorically. Anyway, I hope you're all doing really well. As I say, please continue to pray for Lighthouse and Karen's ministry with the children today. Um, I, I think I'm from memory. She's doing the devotion tomorrow, so I'm sure she'll give us an update on how it's all going. So. God bless. Have a really good rest of the day and uh, see you all tomorrow. Bye bye.